you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to find Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to begin reading this morning in verse 6 and kind of hit through 12 as we continue uh, what we began last week in a series called The King's Speech. And what is probably regarded as the most famous sermon ever preached as Jesus presented what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And if you were here last week, you know we kind of understood that word blessed, which begins all of these verses that we call the Beatitudes. And that word there, it comes from the Greek word makarios, and that means, as we understood it and talked about last week, the good life. You know, the good life is something that really has been the focus of certainly philosophers and scholars for thousands of years. You go back to Aristotle, to Socrates, to Plato, to all of those, as well as others who are contemporaries of theirs and later down the road and even before, who all tried to find what is the good life and how do we live it. And so many answered that question in different ways. Some went to pleasure, some went to a morality of sorts, others went to kind of a, a putting off of everything in life that you could, you could see even thoughts and all those things, almost to an Eastern mysticism of sorts. But it's this idea, and really it's been a quest for all of humanity. How do we live the good life? How do we engage in a life that matters, a life worth living, a life that may leave a legacy, or at least I get the most out of it? And as we talked about and began last week, Jesus introduces the good life, and it's so countercultural to what we see in our world. It looks so different. Last week, we looked at the good life is for those who are poor in spirit. The good life is for those who mourn. The good life is for those who are meek. And before we jump into those this morning, I want to remind us as we approach this scripture, as we approach the Sermon on the Mount, kind of these, if I can put it this way, three fundamental principles or key things for us to understand as we walk through this text. And the first is this, that we have to, to get the Sermon on the Mount, the good life that Jesus is talking about, we have to first reconnect to God, His story, and His ways. And what we mean is that we've been separated from God, and through Christ we can reconnect to Him. And when we reconnect to Him, we reconnect to the greater story, which is His story, that it's not life revolving around us, but it's His and it's his ways that he's given us a way to live in his story, understanding the good life. So that's the first thing. The second is this, that we would realize and recognize that heaven is not on earth. Right? If there's any greater temptation in our culture, in our world, it is to try to make heaven on earth now with the resources, the abilities that we can possibly do that. But there's a reality that as good as it gets here, it doesn't even compare with what's coming, that heaven is not on earth. And the third thing then is this, these foundational principles that we live with a stewardship mentality, that everything that we have in life is not actually ours, it's God's, and we steward what he's given us, and it changes us when we begin to understand that. So if you have your Bibles, if you're physically able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, Matthew chapter 5, as we continue this study this morning. Verse 6 says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, would you speak to us through these words? God, would you change us to look more like Jesus by the power of your spirit? And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So understanding then this good life 
As verse 6 takes us into, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The good life is for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I love that phrase, hunger and thirst, because it At some point, we can all kind of get our minds around that. Now, on a day-to-day basis, we don't necessarily hunger or thirst a lot. Maybe we get a little hungry or hangry, right, as lunch approaches each and every day, but we don't necessarily hunger and thirst. But probably at some point in your journey, you've been hungry, like really hungry, and you remember what that felt like. And so this illustration of hungering after the things of God, or you've been thirsty to the point that you would describe yourself as parched. Right? Maybe your life wasn't being threatened, but you were thirsty. I remember as a kid, we would play outside constantly. And so we would be out there, and, and some of you have probably this shared experience, that as a kid, you don't really think about eating and drinking so much. You just go and go and go to the point of exhaustion. Right? And then you're finally sitting there going, you know what, I'm about to pass out. Maybe I ought to get some water. And this is how you would do it in the day that I kind of grew up. You would go to the closest house, whether it was yours or your neighbor's, and you turn the water hose on. Right, And you remember, you learned once, because one time every kid has put the right there at the beginning, right? It sprays you, and then it's really hot water that's been soaking in the, in the hose for a long time. So you let it run a little bit, and then you start drinking out of it. Do you realize for our day and age, that's like, what? It's, it's not filtered. <laughs> Reverse osmosis has not taken place in that water. What in the world will we do? But you know, having that metallic taste, right? Because the ants have been washed away the ones that crawled in there. Having that metallic taste, that was like a rite of passage. It's like, this is good if it tastes metal. You're getting pieces of that hose. You understand, right? But you were thirsty, and you just needed a drink. And understanding that imagery, would we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Would we hunger and thirst for God's ways? I think it's no mistake that Matthew recording Jesus as Jesus speaks these words would have pointed directly to the chapter before this in the gospel as Matthew records it, that Jesus had gone into the wilderness to be tempted. And if you remember, he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, which means he was extremely hungry at this point. And one of the first temptation that the enemy brings at this place is for Jesus to turn some stones into bread and eat. And this is Jesus' response. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, that we would hunger, thirst for righteousness. Psalm 42 puts it this way, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. And the picture there is in the desert that a deer would pant with thirst, longing for water because it's not abundant. And so it's a long journey from the last time he had taken a drink and he's ready to drink deeply that we would thirst in that way for God. John chapter 6, Jesus has this incredible experience with the crowd as they've gathered. This is a different instance where the crowd has gathered and he's taught and all of that. And and there's this moment where they're all hungry, all of them. And you can imagine 5,000 plus hangry people Right? So they are all hungry, ready for something to eat. There's not enough food. And so Jesus performs this miracle, feeds all of them. Well, the story goes on. Jesus, it says in John, goes to the other side, which means he goes to the other side of the lake or the Sea of Galilee there. And the, all the crowds don't know where he's gone. So they begin looking for Jesus on the next day. And some of them take boats over, realize he's gone over there. They're walking around. They're trying to find Jesus. And Jesus essentially confronts them and says, are you looking for me or are you looking for another free meal? And the scripture says, John 6, 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. In John 6, just a few verses later, he says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. One of the first things for us to get, the good life for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, is a hunger and thirst for God, is a hunger and thirst for his son, is a hunger and thirst realizing that righteousness ultimately only comes through Jesus Christ. 
It's not going to church. It's not doing the right things. It's not saying the right things. It's not acting the right way. Our righteousness only comes through God because the reality is our sin has separated us from a holy God. And Jesus came, died for us, taking our sin upon himself. And then... If we confess him as our Lord and Savior, believing God raised him from the dead, we are given the righteousness of Jesus Christ by his blood shed for us. It's like the blanket that covers us, his righteousness. And so then understanding that we connect with God in that way, reconnect with him through Jesus, we've been given the righteousness of Jesus, now we can choose to live in such a way that we hunger and thirst for God's ways for his word to be impactful in our lives and in the world around us as a result of that. Because that word righteousness is living according to God's ways, living according to his word. It's interesting in our world because there is this dichotomy that exists in the church. And here's how it plays out a lot of times. Because maybe we like the church and kind of some of the the goodness and the blessing that we get when we read through the scriptures, or maybe this has just been routine for us for a while, or whatever reason we kind of come to the church, but then uh, really, Monday through Saturday, our lives in terms of righteousness don't look that much different. It's not really a hunger and a thirst there. And in the church, that difference is devastating because we're not hungering and thirsting for God and his ways. And you see, most, if I can put it this way, in this hungering and thirsting for righteousness in God's ways, in our culture, it's not popular. What's easier is, again, to take the good things that God provides And just say, you know what, the other stuff that kind of, yeah, it starts to make me feel weird on the inside. I start to get this conviction. I don't really want to align my life to that. As a matter of fact, I would like to just put that to the side. Just give me the good stuff, right? Just give me the good things that make me feel good in life. I don't want to deal with the other things. Because here's how our culture has taken this now. If you call sin, sin, and you hunger and thirst for righteousness, that means you're a bigot. That means you're intolerant. There's a reality that you don't care about people in their minds or in the world if you live in such a way that you actually still call sin, sin. Let me give you a great illustration of that. Oliver Thomas writing in USA Today, he's a contributor for them pretty regularly. The the title of the article or subtitle there says this, churches will continue hemorrhaging members until we face the truth. Being a faithful Christian does not mean accepting everything the Bible teaches. Being a faithful Christian does not mean accepting everything the Bible teaches. Oliver Thomas was an American Baptist pastor before he retired. And essentially he's speaking in the article according to the LGBTQ revolution, if I can put it that way. And what he's saying is if you essentially don't get on the right side of history, maybe you've heard it put that way, If you don't come around to just acquiesce those things in the scripture that culturally aren't relevant in their minds anymore, then you're just going to start hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging, leaking (laughs) members. Because you have to get on board with the cultural revolution. Can Can I just challenge us for a minute? That is absolutely the most unloving thing that we could do. While we will be called bigots, while we will be called intolerant and every other name that you can put with that, while we will be yelled at and screamed at, it is the most unloving thing we could do to begin to acquiesce and say sin really isn't sin because we don't think it is anymore. Because today it's LBGDQ, tomorrow it's something else, and then it's something else, and then it's something else. And here's what we're left with in our culture when we stop calling sin, sin. We're left with churches who essentially say, you know what, we're all just going to get to heaven because God is love. And if we're all just going to get to heaven, let's just not worry about how we live. Let's just hug and be tolerant of one another and just kind of hug each other. And we're just going to do this thing and we're going to help each other and all that. And it all sounds so good. But there's a problem. 
The truth is we don't define the world. God does. He created it. And when he created, he created this perfect existence, and yet he gave humanity this opportunity to say yes or no to sin because he didn't create robots who worshiped him. He created people with a choice and a will. And the scripture talks about that every single one of us has chosen our own way, which means we sinned and separated ourselves from a holy God. In John chapter 3, I love this verse. It says, Jesus came into the world. He said, I came to the world not to condemn the world, but to save it. But here's what we sometimes forget with that. He came into the world not to condemn it, but to save it because the world is condemned. You and I, because of the sin that we committed, because of the affront that is to a holy and perfect and good God, it created a distance between us and the only way to get back to a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. We are condemned already. It is only out of the love and mercy and grace of God that he looked upon a people that is his creation and said, I love you enough that I'm going to kill my own son as the perfect sacrifice to take your sin and to give you his righteousness. In your response, you believe in his name and walk in his ways. When we tell people that story, it is the most loving thing we can do, even if they don't feel that way. Because otherwise, there is an eternity that is real that Jesus spoke of more than he did of heaven called hell. Because God's judgment is real. I just I spend some time on that for a moment because as a people of God, to hunger and thirst for righteousness matters. It matters not only in the big picture of the gospel of sharing Christ with others, it matters in our daily walk as we go through our life that we would be a people who are characterized by those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What we do in our homes on Saturday night and Monday morning and Wednesday and every day in between, that it would look different from the world because we hunger and thirst for a God who is different from the world. And then our, light, our lives would be lights to those when they say there's something different about the peace and the joy and the rest that you have in this life. You have purpose that I wish I had, and I'm trying to find it in all these different ways, but it's not working. And so much of it comes back that we hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. Can I just give you a brief illustration? Because here's how I think it works in the church. I think it's often a slow fade, and very subtle. In the first service, I said, some of you may have been alive when this movie was released, and then I was quickly corrected from the audience. It was released in 1938, so I don't think anybody, I didn't know when it was released. So, uh, Gone with the Wind, 1938. The last word in Gone with the Wind, some of you are like, I've heard of that movie. I've heard of the wind, right? So, the last word in that movie was a cuss word. First time a cuss word had ever been put on the screen. And it was shocking. Fast forward. Fast forward to my generation. You know, the most popular shows really in my generation, and the one just a little bit before, Seinfeld, Friends. Friends was like a cult, right? If you watched Friends, you had to keep up to be able to converse in the conversation of the day and all of that. And yet, here's how it worked for Christians. We would say, oh, but it's so funny. It's so funny. I know they're sleeping with each other. I know that they're doing, they're talking about things that you really probably aren't necessarily good with scripture and all that, but they're funny. And then we continue to do that. And it's a slow fade. And today, most of the things that come out, my kids don't even understand why we won't go see them or watch them. Jessie looked at me the other day and she said, have you ever read about what's in this thing? And I'm gonna throw one out there, Game of Thrones. And I said, no. And she goes, if you just read about it, it's so perverse. It's so violent. Like, how do you do that? It's a slow fade. And if it's Game of Thrones or whatever else, it's a slow fade where all of a sudden we fill our minds and our hearts with things that are so far from the righteousness of God. I don't mean to pick on one thing, but it's a great illustration of where we've come as a society where that doesn't even shock us anymore. Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? 
I was reading this week and just my weekly reading of going through the scriptures and I was in Psalm 119, which when you open that up and you're in any sort of a hurry at all, you're like, I'm reading Psalm 119 today. It's a really long chapter if you've never read it. But there are two great verses that stood out. Psalm 119, 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. And then Psalm 119, 15 and 16, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The good life is for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and get the promise at the end of it, for they will be satisfied. In our vernacular, that word means stuffed. You'll be filled you will find satisfaction in life that every single one of us craves only in Christ, only in hungering and thirsting for his ways, for the ways that lead to life and abundance. You will be satisfied. So let me just give you some practical questions as we kind of started last week to help us maybe these this soak in a little easier. Do you hunger and thirst for Jesus? and follow God's ways in your life? Do you hunger and thirst for Jesus and follow his ways? This one hurts. Do you grieve over your sin? Not just to, oh God, I did it again, please forgive me. Does it hurt you? Do you grieve over it because you realize in that relationship with your king, with your father, with a good God who loves you, it grieves his heart. And then the third question is this. When you come across in God's word things that contradict the way you live, do you quickly learn to align your life to his ways? The good life is for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It goes on in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And this exercising mercy specifically deals with others in our life that we come in contact with. And, and understanding the context is a little bit helpful. So this is a very much a Middle Eastern context. And for centuries and thousands of years, the context of the Middle East is you were almost lifted up or honored if you held a grudge well. Right, If you were to hold a grudge in such a way that thousands of years ago, so-and-so did something to my family, it killed a donkey that stepped into a hole and they never repaid us back, and so now thousands of years later, we're still angry and at war with this family, and we still get at each other all the way back to this point. And that's almost honored in the culture, this idea that you would hold a grudge that you would not allow forgiveness to even enter into the picture. And so understanding that context as he's speaking to these disciples and as the crowd is gathering around, as he says, the good life is for those who are merciful. Micah 6a, has he, who has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, or do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So how do we show mercy or who do we show it to? First of all, we understand that we show mercy to those who are far from God. Matthew 9, 13 says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, the Pharisees, the religious people had gotten up in arms because Jesus was spending time with those who were far from God. As a matter of fact, at this point in the scripture, he was spending time with this tax collector, which nobody, even in our age wants to spend time with tax collectors. So he's spending time with the tax collector, and the tax collector happens to be named Matthew, who writes the gospel today, because Jesus loved him and understood he came to save sinners, and Matthew becomes a follower of Jesus and ends up writing the gospel that now 2,000 years later we're reading. Because how do we do that? We exercise mercy, love towards those who are far from God, even when they hurt us, which we'll read about in just a moment. Who else do we exercise mercy toward? Toward anyone who hurts us. Matthew 18, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And at that point in the culture, seven times would have been like super Christian. 
Right? He would have been like, yeah, I've forgiven you seven times. I don't know what happens exactly on the eighth time, but seven times we were all good. And Jesus looks back at him and said, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Some scriptures say 70 times seven, and essentially the meaning is this. As many times as he sins against you, you forgive him. Really? The good life is for those who are merciful. As many times. Why? Why? Because we worship a God who models mercy and forgiveness. Exodus 34, 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And I think the greatest illustration or example that we can see of God's incredible mercy is in Luke chapter 23 when we see Jesus on the cross and he makes this statement, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The mercy that is poured forth from Jesus in that moment, the mercy that is poured forth from his shed blood, not only for those who were standing there, but for all of us, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And through his death and resurrection, he provides forgiveness for those who believe in his name. So practically, how do we do this? Do I assume the best of others quickly offering mercy and forgiveness? Do I assume the best of others quickly offering mercy and forgiveness? And then this one always gets me. Is there someone in my life that makes me bristle? And you know what I'm talking about. Some of you just smile, right? Sometimes it follows with the words in-law. Sometimes it doesn't. Thankfully, I don't have that in my own situation. But do I, is there someone when I think about when they come to mind or when I see them in a hallway or whatever it is, it's like, oh, because you know there's something there. Yes, amen. <laughs> Joe, we got an amen on that one. You know there's something there that you need to deal with, right? Is there someone in your life that makes you bristle that forgiveness and mercy needs to be offered? And then this last one, do I live in gratitude remembering all that I have been forgiven? How do we offer mercy and forgiveness? Because for some, and we joke about those that are very easy, for some, forgiveness is really hard because of abuse, because of a lot of pain. But yet, the good life is for those who are merciful and the promise there, for they will receive mercy. And think about what we've already received in terms of mercy from Christ, and we will continue to receive because of what Christ has done and will continue to do, that we receive mercy. Jesus goes on, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Seeing God in both the Old and the New Testament was this amazing gift, this incredible thing that they looked forward to and knew wouldn't take place fully until eternity. And so for those, that was an incredible gift, understanding we get to see the one in whose image that we are made. Blessed are those, or the good life is for those who are pure in heart. Psalm 24 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, and does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. And in that imagery of that psalm, as you would walk up to Jerusalem and up to the temple, it's always an upward climb. And so, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who is good enough? Who can go up there? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. And we understand through Jesus that the only way we can be made pure is through Jesus. And so that's where that begins. And then as we walk faithfully with him, purifying our hearts, choosing to live as those who are pure in heart. Here's a good test for this, Titus 1.15. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. So let me ask you this, with that, is your heart, is your mind, especially in the areas of jokes and all of that, go immediately to impure places? Because that's a good test. The 
good life is for those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. And there's a reality to this. There's a hardness to this because the Scripture often speaks about our hands and our feet and the things, the places that we walk and the things that we do with our hands, our actions. That psalm even just spoke about it. You know what? We can all see each other in the actions we live out and the places our feet take us. But our hearts, God sees that. And the only way anyone other than God sees that is if we choose to open ourselves up and to say, I'm going to live vulnerable enough because I hunger and thirst for righteousness enough and to be of pure heart, then I'm going to lift, allow someone to look in to hold me accountable. That promise again, for they shall see God. Psalm 24, 6, just a few verses under the one I just read. It said, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. So practically, let me ask you these questions. Is my motivation, the thing that drives me, focused on God's kingdom or mine? Is my motivation, my heart, the things that drive me, focused on God's kingdom or mine? And the second one, is there anyone you are fully honest with concerning even the motivations of your heart? Do you have that person in your life that you say, here is how much of a sinner I am because the good life is for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and the good life is for those who are pure in heart because I want to be pure in heart and to hunger and thirst for the things that are right before God and so I am an open book. Would you help me? As if that's not enough this morning. Verse 9, the scripture goes on, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The good life is for those who are peacemakers. And again, understanding that context, we talk about the Middle Eastern piece of it, but there's even more to that. Remember, in this story, Jesus has sat down as he has begun to teach what is called the Sermon on the Mount because that's what a rabbi does when he teaches. So his disciples are gathered close around him. The crowd continues to fill in as they hear more and more as they're approaching. And at this point, Jesus says with his disciples listening close, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And in that group, Group, there's at least one zealot that we know of for sure. And you say, why does that matter? What is a zealot? Well, if I can put it this way, a Pharisee is someone who holds up the book, right? Not always the right motivations, but they're going to live by the book, the religious people of the day. A zealot is just as zealous for the book, but so much so that they also hold up the knife. I don't have a knife to hold up, so just have to imagine for me, with me. What does that mean? It means if you don't live by the book, I have every right to take you out. And then Jesus looks at that and says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It's startling, isn't it? It's hard. Who do we Look to pursue peace with. Well, Scripture first tells us to pursue peace. Psalm 34, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. means we're active in that. And so who are we to be at peace with? Scripture is very clear in kind of two specific categories. First of all, kind of gets everyone because that's who it is, is everyone. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul goes right after that in Romans 13 and begins to talk about the government. And he says, pray for the peace uh, or pray for the leaders of the government that we would be able to live in peace, so that we could carry out the mission of God without worrying about the government coming down on us. It's why we uh, pray even in our own country often uh, for the leaders that they would have godly decisions that are made in a godly mentality, that they would be those who would lead in such a way that we could live peaceably in the life that we have so that the gospel would go forward peaceably. Right? So as much as it is possible to live at peace with everyone, that's our goal. But there's a specific place that he often talks about over and over in the scriptures, and that's being at peace within the church. 1 Thessalonians 5, be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. 
Why is that important? Because out of the love that we demonstrate towards one another, the gospel is clearly seen to the world that needs to see it. And when we're disunified as a church, what we communicate to the world is what they preach doesn't really work. That that scripture thing isn't really worthwhile. But when we have unity, and I don't mean just unity that we all agree, but spirit-led unity, unity that is united around the scripture and God's truth, then we march forward. Blessed are the peacemakers. The good life is for those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. The greatest illustration, Colossians 1.20, it paints a beautiful picture to understand that we were at enmity, as the scripture says, at war with God, and Jesus, the ultimate peacemaker, came and made peace by the blood of his cross. And so we follow in that. Practically, do you pursue peace? Do you take an active role in making amends And the second question is this, and this one's always fun. Are you quick to listen and then quick to forgive? Quick to listen, to hear the other side of the story, and then quick to forgive. So all of these that we have called the Beatitudes now lead to really this last one, and and it's kind of spread out here a little bit because verses 11 and 12 really uh, kind of expand on what verse 10 says. So this is really the last of these. And, And again, I talked about this last week. The very first one, the promise is for right now, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then this one says the same, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's this moment where you see the blessing that takes place here and then also in the future. And it says this, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The good life is for those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, if we were taking this at face value, how does that even make sense? Because the good life, the good life Wouldn't you think that others would see the good life and not persecute you? No, we have an enemy at work who deceives others. And so the reality is the world will look at us just as we talked about in the beginning and persecute, cause harm, frustrate those who are living the good life. But the promise remains that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So how do we begin to handle persecution? And let me begin by saying this. I was reading through this and preparing this week, and there are those moments when, for me, and and feeling that, um, if I can put it this way, weight of being a pastor, that I feel like I have to say this in such a way that to understand that to prepare us for what I think will likely happen, maybe not in my lifetime, but probably the lifetime of my kids, that we will experience significant persecution of the Christian church in America. By far, from secular authors and from Christian authors, the most persecuted faith in the world is those of Christians, by far, hands down. And if you don't see it in our culture already, in the names that you're being called and all of that for standing on the truth of God's word, there's just a reality. I pray against it nearly every single day, but there's a reality that we're heading this direction that we will face persecution. And so how do we do that as a church? First of all, the We see in Scripture over and over, it tells us, don't be surprised. When you live and choose to live the good life as God has described it, as Jesus has taught us, you will be persecuted. 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. First of all, don't be surprised. That's why I say I think it's coming. I hope not. I pray not. But I think it's coming. The second thing is we're not to fear. 1 Peter 3 puts it this way. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. What I love about what Peter says there is don't be afraid, but also don't back down. Remember, if you love people, 
Our love for Christ and others compels us to tell the story of what we will always call the gospel, which means good news, no matter what the world says it is. So we don't fear. We're not surprised. Thirdly, we don't return the favor of persecution. Romans 12, repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That we respond not in kind, but the opposite. And we love people even as we are persecuted. And next, we would take heart because we understand we're in good company. Verse 11 out of Matthew 5, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Understanding that when we suffer, we share in the very sufferings of Jesus who knew exactly what was coming when he taught these, these, these verses. And not only that, but we suffer with all truth-tellers who have gone before us, often called the prophets and scriptures, who suffered for telling and speaking the truth. Take heart, you're in good company. And the final thing, how do we prepare for this? We always remember what's ahead. 2 Corinthians 4, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. As Jesus just said in verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. How do we endure persecution? How do we live the good life understanding we're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We remember exactly what's coming. And we walk faithfully toward it. Two quick questions. Are you living in such a way that your life would bring any level of persecution? That's a hard one. Are you living in such a way that your life would bring any level of persecution? And then do you have an eternal perspective? To close this morning, let me say this. Just reminding us to live this life is empowered only by the grace and goodness of God. This is not something we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and try harder. This is something where we live this life understanding Jesus is our righteousness. And then in him, we get to choose to be peacemakers. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are pure in heart, those who give mercy, and those who are blessed when we're persecuted for righteousness' sake. It's an invitation to live a good life that is so against our culture. But in it, in it we find peace, rest, purpose, and what this was supposed to be like. In heaven, well, what we encounter here doesn't even compare. Would you bow your heads with me? In just a moment, we're going to have a time of response, just a time that we get to worship, let these words that from the scriptures settle in our hearts. There's something going on in your life where you need prayer. It could be anything related to today or not. Our staff will be down front. We would love the opportunity to pray with you about whatever it might be. I just want to give you a moment right now just to seek the Lord. Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the truth that is from your scripture and how it changes us. God, would we be faithful to wrestle with the ways that you are working in our hearts and our minds, not to walk away from those, but to wrestle with you through them and align our lives to your ways. Thank you for the abundant life found in Jesus. 
Father, may we now respond however you may lead us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.